We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Why don't you say hi to somebody around you really quick and uh, just welcome somebody to the house today.
we pour it out. Place their hope and confidence in Jesus. 
scripture in Kings, 1 Kings 19, 11. And I feel a lot of the missing ingredient in some of our worship today is found in this scripture. Elijah's on the run from Jezebel and the Lord gives him instruction to meet with him in the cleft of the rock. And the Lord says he's gonna pass by him. And there's a few ways that happen. Initially, there's a shaking, then there's a wind, and there's a fire. And the scripture says that the Lord wasn't in any of those things. But then it says there was a gentle whisper. to this on our Wednesday shelter night and I just I feel this invitation in the room today there's a gentle whisper after this shaking and after this fire after all these big violent explosive expressions there's this still soft movement and it was there that he heard the Lord's voice received the instruction that he needed. I just feel like it's so easy for life to get noisy. And if we're honest, it's easy to bring that same need for noise into our spaces of worship, into our gatherings. Sometimes what the Lord wants to speak and how he wants to meet with you isn't something wayless abrasive and way more gentle because here's the truth of the matter Elijah was already going through a fire his life was already shaking and in his soul it already seemed like things were tossing back and forth so the Lord doesn't come in those ways he came in the way that he needed and maybe today there's a bit of fire there's a bit of shaking. There's a bit of wind blowing back and forth. Can I encourage you this morning that the gentle whisper of God is here? So before we sing this next song, let's make room for the whisper. I know silence can be uncomfortable. Let's just take a few moments listen for the whisper of Holy Spirit this morning. He's here to meet with you. He's here to lift the burden. He's here to set the captive free. He's here to heal the broken heart.
And I'm Noelle. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Day! Here are some things we've got coming up. God has richness and relationships available for every season of life. Prime Timers is a ministry for those in their prime of life, 65 and over. These monthly luncheons provide a place of connection and community. Join our next one happening May 15th from 11 to 1. If you would like to serve our community and help save a life, we invite you to participate in the Red Cross Blood Drive on Monday, May 20th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the East Building Chapel. To learn more, head to b4church.org slash events. Soccer camp is a free outreach camp for kids in our community who can't afford sports camps. And we want to bless the kids with a pair of shoes. We are collecting soccer shoes used or new in the commons through June 23rd. To learn more, or how to serve, head to b4church.org slash soccer camp. To learn more about other weekly events and all the things going on this summer, head to b4church.org. And that is all we have for you today. We hope you have a great service and we will see you next week. Hi guys, it's good to see you. I've been on vacation with my toes in the sand for a couple of weeks. And before I left, people said, bring the sun back with you. And you're welcome. Did it. <laughs> Check. Um, ushers, if you'd like to come on forward, we're going to give our offering. Like we just sang in the song, bring your offering. This is a way that not only we bless Jesus, but it blesses our hearts to be givers. And um, we're going to talk about it that a little more today. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've given us and trusted us with. And we ask that you would receive this offering from our humble, happy hearts. We love and worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, it is Mother's Day, and I really love this day. I found out that today is the lowest crime rate day of the year because mothers have done a good job teaching their kids, at least on Mother's Day. Don't do it on Mother's Day, or moms are doing a lot of crime, and on Mother's Day, they go to church, and so maybe it's that. I don't know, but I do know that Mother's Day is a complicated <clears throat> day for a lot of people. I mean, if we're honest, invented pretty much by Hallmark, um, and it's not Hallmark happy for everyone, and we can no longer do a one-size-fits-all blessing for Mother's Day. It, it doesn't work. And it can create pain. And so I, I wrote a blessing for the moms today. And I want to read it um, to the moms who have held hearts and dreams and secrets brilliantly. And for those who are still figuring it out through trial and error, thank you for your selfless love. To the moms who are more exhausted than exhilarated by the job right now, juggling calendars and carpool lanes, we are cheering you on. To those who have become the kind of mom they never had, through sheer force of will and stubborn determination, we are amazed by you. To those who stepped in to love a child when their biological mom could not or would not, we thank you for filling hungry hearts with love. To those who are missing a mom or missing a child who has been lost to death, distance, or dysfunction, we hold space for your sadness today. To those who long for a child, but that dream has not yet been realized, we pray that God meets you in exactly the way you need him to. May this day and every day find you tucked beneath the wings of the God who loves you like a hen loves her chicks, closely, carefully, and forever. Would you give the moms in the room a round of applause for all that they do? We 
We love you. It is the hardest job you'll ever love, and we're glad that you are committed to it. Um, here at Before, we, there are four words that are going to really define our future as a church, as a community of faith. We are a kingdom neighborhood, big kingdom, tons of neighborhoods. This is our neighborhood, and I love it so much. Um, but there are four words that I feel like the Lord keeps telling us over and over and over again, and they matter to me more than any other words right now. And they are hope, healing, freedom, and flourishing. Hope, healing, freedom, and flourishing. We are going to be a house of hope for eternity and a house of healing and a house of freedom and a house where people can flourish in this garden. That is our dream, but it's not just a dream. It's not just a wish. We're not just crossing our fingers and wishing real hard. We are praying and believing and planning and preparing to become the kind of house that God has called us to be. So healing and freedom are two of the words that I want to hit today because they matter a lot in this whole process and in becoming a garden that can flourish. Nothing can flourish that's in bondage. Nothing can flourish that's sick and broken. So healing and freedom are two of the big ones. They can sound similar, but they're actually very distinct and yet synergistic. They work together, especially in the Bible. Now, I recently got distracted as I was studying for something else. I was studying actually for what today's message was supposed to be, and as I got down this rabbit hole of this one word, I, my, I was just in my office thinking, oh my goodness, oh this is, oh this is what I want, this is what we want to know, this is what we want to hear about, and so there, there are, there are way, we, I love to teach line by line and word by word, it's exegetical, love that kind of teaching, but I also love the Jesus kind of teaching that says, look at this loaf of bread, and there's a log, and here's a splinter, and there's this shaker of salt. What are you going to do with that? How Jesus is always tethering big theological principle to actual things we can see and hear and smell and taste and touch so that we understand him, so that we live in an embodied kingdom. Here we are living and breathing like Jesus in his world. And that's what happens when we take a word and we follow it all the way. It's, we follow its whole trajectory through the word of God. And the word we're going to look at today is a word, it's a Greek word, centribo. And the word is found four times in the Gospels. Four times we see this word show up, and we're going to look at all four times and see what it has to tell us about healing and freedom. The word centribo means, and I'm sorry about this, I could have picked a happier word. It means to break by crushing, to break in pieces, to shatter, to crush, to bruise. It's actually the word broken, and it's not just cracked. It means crushed. In fact, Cliff and I were watching an old-timey show the other day, and somebody used the word smithereens. And I was like, bring back smithereens. That's a great word. We don't use that enough anymore. And then I ran into this word, and I was like, it's the Greek word smithereens. It's, bra it's broken. It's all the way broken. The Gospels tell us four fast stories, and I'm going to tell them fast today as well, about things that get broken. And what happens to them? And so, you know, the right answer, the answer that you're supposed to say, especially when you're in church, is Jesus is always going to heal broken things, right? Not in these stories. In these stories, two things are better off broken and two things get healed. So let's look at them and see where this thread takes us. The first story is found in Mark 5. It says they went across the lake to the region of the, you know what? I look this word up all the time. Steve Mitchell, you want to take a crack at government? <laughs> I never can remember how to say that word. Um, but when he got there, he got out of the boat and a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. And even with a chain, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out, and cut himself with stones. I cannot imagine a worse life than this one. This life where this man is, well, here in a minute, he is, has a, Jesus asks, what is the name of the spirit? And the spirit says, my name is Legion. There's a bunch of us in here. 
He is so tormented and so he is so caught up in his own despair. He doesn't know how to get out of it. He is crying out for help. He is cutting himself. He is in this place of utter despair and the people don't know how to fix him. So the best they know how to do is chain him. Can you imagine a worse fate than to be chained up with the things you're trying to get free from? The people are just like, if you could just take your disorder over there, if we could just domesticate your disorder so at least fits in our church service without making a scene, this is what's happening to this guy out the tomb. And so Jesus comes and meets him, and Jesus says, I'll build a better chain. And then you can stay bound and no one will be bothered by you. No, that is not at all what Jesus does. Those chains are supposed to be broken. Those chains aren't supposed to keep him bound up. He is supposed to be healed so he can be free. That is the goal of Jesus. Jesus did not come to build better chains. He did not come to make you more um, fit for civilized society. He didn't come so that you could just bring your disorder into this very clean, ordered sanctuary and live with it. He came to set us free. And sometimes that's going to be messy. And sometimes when we don't know what to do with the mess itself, instead we just fence in the behavior so that we feel okay about what we're doing. Not here. We want to be people who understand the healing power of Jesus that breaks through chains and gets to the actual war that rages inside our hearts. I went to a women's retreat once, actually 5,000 times. I've been to 5,000 women's retreats. That's an actual number. Um, And... The retreat organizer had cards and they had 10 things on them and they were things like, I have experienced rape. I have lost a child. I was abused by a parent. I was abandoned by a spouse. They were really, really difficult things. And it was a beautiful group of ladies, maybe 200 women. All of them looked great. None of them were cutting themselves. None of them were looked like they were dealing with anything. They were dressed pretty. They looked great. And they had, she had everybody mark them anonymously. And then everyone threw their card back in the bucket. And then we all picked a card out. And we stood when she said, whatever is on your card. And so we're standing in proxy for people we don't know who have written, I have experienced rape. I've experienced abuse. I've experienced abandonment. And there's not a dry eye in the place. Everyone's just crying because we didn't know all of those wars were raging all around us. Instead, we just all came and bought our retreat clothes and packed our suitcase and came in and sat nicely in the rows. And then it's like, wait a minute, there's all this going on in the sister next to me. And I'm going to just tell you that's true every single Sunday when you walk in this building. A couple of weeks ago, I had a word at the end of service and I said, I feel like somebody experienced something 12 years ago that was defining in a way that God wants to heal you from. And I said these words, I said, don't leave this place until you meet with someone and pray with them about this. You are in despair. Don't leave this place. And three different people came to me with incredible stories of things that had happened 12 years ago. And every one of them said this to me, I only came up here because you said, don't leave this place. So let me just make a blanket statement once and for all, May 12th, 2024, don't leave this place. If you're in despair ever, any Sunday, any Monday, any Tuesday, Don't leave this place. Connect with someone so that you can pray. We can get a little messy. It's okay. It's okay to show up here and not be okay. It's Jesus wants to help. He wants to meet you and he can help with each other. We haven't figured it all out yet. We haven't figured out how healing works exactly. In fact, our staff is getting some intense training this summer to help people get to the root of the scars that they wear and the scars that they hide so that we can be a church that's known as a house of healing and freedom. 
I mean, because otherwise, what are you going to pick a church based on the worship or the color of the carpet or the, what do you, I mean, what is church for if it isn't to come and experience actual life change, healing to the hurt? So Jesus heals him and everyone's thrilled about it. No, they aren't. They uninvite him to their town. Um, They've decided they don't want to be a town of healing and freedom. They want him to get the heck out of there. And so he does. So, okay, next story. We're going so fast. Can you believe it? Look how fast we're going. Um, Luke 9. Jesus has just been with his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. They met with Moses and Elijah. While they're up there, Peter's like, this is great. Let's make our church up here. We'll build a building here. And then we'll bring a sound system up. And we'll get some small group leaders. And this is where we'll all stay. And Jesus is like, calm down, sir. We're going back to town. We have to go back to where the actual people are. And so then they go, come down from the mountain and a large crowd meets them. This is bad news. You know, <laughs> it's always bad news if a large crowd meets you as you're coming down from a very beautiful moment. A man in the crowd called out, teacher, I beg you. The word, this word beg in the Greek is desperate. I beg you to look at my son for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him and is destroying him. The word destroying here, centribo, smithereens. It is destroying him. Um, I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? It's pretty sassy for someone who's just been with Moses and Elijah, you know, but he's ready. Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the impure spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. He gives the father back what? His only son. What is being broken in this story? The last story, we see broken chains. This story, we see a broken boy, and he's his only son, so this is a broken legacy. This is the only heir to the father's money, to his possessions, the only one who will carry on his name, and it's also his dear, beloved boy. In the language, it looks like this is an actual boy. And Jesus comes to say, This brokenness needs to be healed. This brokenness needs to be delivered. I can give you your legacy back. And if you are someone who sits here today and you are fearing for your legacy, for a child who is maybe tormented, for a child who feels so far from you, I would like you to look in this story at how many things the father can control. Zero. How many hearts can you control? None of the hearts. You know, when your kids are like two or three, maybe some of you are going to laugh at me when I say this. I was going to say, you can control them. (laughs) Sometimes you actually can't when they're two or three. When your kids are little, you can pick them up and put them where you want them to go. You have some control over their actions. You have control over their schedule. You have control over what they eat. But you never ever one day in her child's life have control over their heart. Never, ever one time. And so could that just be a blessing today? Could we just say that's good news, not bad news? If you had control over your kid's heart, what would you do with it? Are you that smart? And so we can trust God with our legacy. But this took some work. This man had to get to Jesus And so, I mean, I have 10 kids, and this morning in my journal, I wrote the words, I'm determined to trust you with the hearts I love that I can't control. I'm determined to trust you with the hearts I love that I can't control. And so I will pray, and I will fast, and I will believe, and I will shh, instead of trying to control hearts. Um... Tuesday nights we pray here 
We pray through these seats. We pray for you. We pray for the church. We pray for decisions. We pray for each other. But this Tuesday night, we're going to pray for kids. Our kids are faced with an absolute tsunami onslaught of evil in the world they are living They are being faced with so many choices I never imagined, bless you. They are being faced with so many things, so much, and we can, we can look at a lot of things. We can say it's identity, it's, it's, it's drugs, it's all of the things, but I'm going to tell you the thing that scares me the most for our kids is they are drowning in an epidemic of loneliness. They have never been more seen or more out there and had more contacts and more friends and be more lonely. We need to pray and stand and build kids at before that know they are loved, know they are loved by God, know they are loved by grown-ups, know they are loved, and there is a good future for their life. That is our goal. And so Tuesday night, we're going to pray for kids by name. If you have a kid or a grandkid or a niece or a nephew or someone that is on your heart, show up Tuesday at 7, and we're going to pray together and believe. Fasting is a big deal, and another rendition of this story, Jesus says, this kind of only comes out by prayer and fasting. You're going to have to put some muscle into it. And this is the muscle. So this is story number two. Story number three, while I was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly, 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 wow, to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Uh, We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, this scripture. And the thing I want to look at today, though, is just this idea that she comes and she breaks the bottle at Jesus' feet. This bottle is filled with her life savings. It's her reputation. It's the guarantee that she won't have to depend on someone else to take care of her when she's old. This bottle matters. It, this isn't like us bringing our bottle of, you know, Prada and just, there's a hundred bucks. I just got rid. Nope. This is, this is her life. And there's a difference between breaking a bottle and pouring something out. When you pour something out, you get to control where it goes and how much. When you break a bottle, you give up all control over where it goes and how much. You decide when you break a bottle, all of this is gone from me. This isn't mine anymore. This belongs to someone else. And this is what she does for him. And the thing we don't see in any of this scripture is where Jesus asked her to. There's never a place where Jesus says, hey, sister, will you give me that perfume? This is just this wild generosity. It's this extravagant wasting of her life at the feet of Jesus. And it's so beautiful. I think generosity does this to us. Whenever I get like worried about money or finances or the future, the best thing I can do is write a check. For some of those, those are those paper things that you sign your name to and they, to the bank gives you money. It's a thing. It's a whole old thing. I use an abacus to figure out (laughs) best thing it can do. Giving is a revolt against the scarcity mindset that keeps us so chained up in America. So chained up. Being in, and we, uh, we, we talk about giving because it's good for the church. It's good for a million reasons, but it is good for us. It changes us. It frees us. Generosity is step one to get free. And it happens with your money. It happens with your life. It happens with your talent. It happens with your time. Whenever you're willing to break the bottle and say, I'm going to give this to the kingdom. I'm going to give this to Jesus. It sets you free in a way that nothing else can do. There's this story that's kind of famous about a missionary named James Calvert. He went as a missionary to the cannibals of the Fiji Islands, and the ship captain tried to warn him and said, if you do this, you and everybody with you is going to lose their lives. And to that, he replied, we died before we came. He already broke the bottle. Whatever happened to the contents is up to God. I never see a place where where Mary is going back going, hey, what, uh, what'd you do with that perfume I poured out? What, 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 how did you use that? Never. She just dies to it. And <clears throat> I love living a life where there's nothing to guard and nothing to lose. 
where it's just, I just want to break, I just want to break my life out. Our friend Onaje has done that recently. Gave up a job and said, I'm going to live my life helping worshipers become worship leaders who know him. Broke the bottle on what God is calling him to do. I, I just, I, I love this idea. If we can just extravagantly waste our lives on Jesus. Last story. I don't know about you, but I'm impressed with me. I'm pretty impressed that I am four stories in and we have seven minutes left. Okay, Luke 4, Jesus comes into the temple. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Worship team, you can come on back. Um, So what's broken in this story? Heart. It's a broken heart. Chains don't get fixed. Chains are meant to stay broken. Legacy, kids, Jesus wants to heal that. Uh, Hearts, Jesus wants to heal that. Jesus wants to heal that. He comes to hear broke, heal broken hearts. And here's the thing. It's interesting in our culture right now, broken hearts sell. They sell movies. They sell music. They sell books. They sell documentaries. We have all experienced heartbreaking something. And so we watch it and we, we relive it and we imagine it. And it keeps us looking always at these broken hearts like, that. well, that's just what happens. And it is what happens. But Jesus came to set us free and to bring healing to broken hearts because watching it is one thing. Living it is excruciating and you know it. Time heals all wounds. Not of the people I pray with up front here are any indication it doesn't. Time doesn't have magic to heal something. Only Jesus. Only Jesus heals wounds. Broken hearts are everywhere. And I always wonder how we would treat one another if we could see someone's heart condition first. Our comfort as those who stumble through our pilgrimage here in a world that is not fair or kind or easy, is that Jesus stood in that temple that day and declared his mission statement was to heal the broken hearts. Which broken hearts? Near as I can tell, all of them. I think he came to heal all of them. He came to heal us to wholeness, to heal us to new life. And that healing can happen immediately or gradually, but it's a healing that leads to freedom and life. Jesus came to free us from shackles and limitations. And Jesus came to heal us, our generational legacy and our broken hearts. He came for all those things. So let's land the plane. Um, oh, Naja, you can come on back. I think you're sneaking around back there. You can come on back. Um, where do you find yourself this morning? Onaje talked about hearing the wind and the whisper of the Holy Spirit. Would you take a minute where you are just to listen? Just listen. Does he want to speak to you about legacy, your shackles, your limitations, containers, your heart? Jesus, we hear you. And we ask, Father, that you would meet every heart where it is, each wound, each place that is captive, that feels bound, that feels broken or wounded, 
God, would you be the God of all peace, the God of all comfort, the God of all life today? Would you meet us in places of desperation? Would you meet us inside of our our longing? As we linger in front of your presence, God, would you be the God that comes and restores and sets free? You restore us back to life and you set us free into new life. Would you give us courage to let the broken things that need to stay broken, stay broken? And would you give us courage to trust you for healing, for new life? Sister, here in this front row, I just have felt Jesus, he saw the moment you broke that bottle. He saw it and he knew it and he loves your sacrifice. Even if no one else understands it, even if it looks absurd to the watching world, Jesus loves your sacrifice and he loves your heart and he is coming for you. He is coming for you. a really brave song. We make room for you to do whatever you want. Jesus, thank you that we can trust you to do whatever you want to do with us. I ask
ask that you would make us a house of hope and healing and freedom and flourishing. I ask that you would make us people who are discontent to just order their lives and not heal them. God, I ask that you would make us hungry for the freedom that only you can bring and the flourishing that only your Holy Spirit can inspire. And so God, we give you our lives today and our hearts and we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me? Prayer people, if you wanna come on up. Um, if God's speaking to you about something, some measure of healing, some measure of freedom that you're looking for in your life, you wanna join with someone and pray for a child you're worried about, would you please, can I say it again, don't leave until you've had a moment to connect with someone. I'll be down here, I'd love to pray with you. We, these people have been praying all morning. They've been praying for you and believing for you. Please, we just take this moment to say, God, I just wanna step in front of you with someone else and pray. Okay, benediction time. Also next week, we're gonna start a new series. We're going through Ephesians this summer and we're gonna be talking about how God shows up in the church, especially how we believe he's gonna show up in this body as we move forward. And it's gonna be a great series. I'm super excited about it. So if you would like to receive the benediction, feel free to put your hands out in front of you. May you be men and women who realize the healing and freedom of Jesus. May you offer up your shackles and your limitations to his magnificent liberation. And may you offer your hearts and your legacy to his healing in everything. May you know his loving kindness following after you to set you truly, wildly free. In the name of the one who sets everything free. Amen. We love you so, so much. Thank you for being here this week and we'll see you next week. Touch base with a prayer person.